your, your relationship with God begins really with the fear of God and then your faith. I believe before you have faith in God, you, be, you begin to fear him. You realize um, he is your creator and what he says goes. Um, it's that reality check of there is this fear of God to say, I have nothing in eternity without God. So then from that is faith and faith. Um, um, then your relationship with God is continually built on not saving faith, but faith in a relationship. There is a relationship that you have with God, and that is super important. I know people just think once they get saved, it's all good. They're going to heaven. That's just not a relationship. That's like me going to the store with my kids. You ever been to a store with kids? Any store. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and you have grandkids, so yeah, it's even worse. Because Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's, it, it works like this. Dad, can we have that? Can we have that? Can we? It's Rolaids. <laughs> but it's in a pack. Okay. You go down. Can I have that? Can I have that? Can I have that? It's a sticker. I mean, they go nuts for anything. Anything that has a price tag on it. They just go nuts. Can I have that? Can I have that? Can I have that? Oh, Dad, I need that. Oh, I wanted that all my life. What does it do? I don't know, but I wanted it all the time. I mean, it's like going through and just, you walk to the store, and it's constantly. And then I love this, because now that my kids are older, we're doing this thing. But yeah, if you pay for it, you can have it. I'll pay you back. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. If you pay for it, you can have I think my kids actually have more money in the bank than I do. I, I, really, I mean, they save money like crazy. It's because we keep buying them, right? Uh, buying them anything, right? So we go through the store, and it's constantly the same. So then you finally give in because it is persistence. Persistence works. So you finally get to that point that you finally get over to something that you think they might actually want. It's, you know, it's finally like... Um, in Nathan's case, it, it would be one of those guns that look, shoot those little bullets out. And, you know, you finally find one. In Hannah's case, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Always expensive when it comes down to Hannah. Uh, nothing's cheap. Um, but um, th it just these things. So you finally find something. You think, okay, all right. Um, some artsy kit, um, some gadgets you're putting together, some, something that will blow up. You would think that Nathan would want something that blows up in the backyard. It's Hannah. Hannah would want the things that blow up in the backyard. So anyway, something that you finally go and buy, and you buy it, and you take it home, and they don't even just barely open the box. Never touch it again. When we walked through that store, it was like, I have to have it! And then you get home, and it's like pushed to the side. Nathan has two remote control cars that you can control from your iPhone that we bought him for his birthday because he had to have them. Um, I think I may have seen those going around the house maybe one or two times. You had to have that. But you don't even play with it anymore. It's like as you walk through the store, I think they have gas, like gas that comes out of the vents that just makes you want what's ever in their store. Some kind of secret guest. Some kind of music. Remember Coca-Cola used to have those? Did you remember that when Coca-Cola finally figured out? This was so intense. What Coca-Cola figured out. That they, um, they sent subliminal messages through the grocery store speakers. And would say, buy Coke, buy Coke, buy Coke. It was so effective that they had to tell the government about it. Because people were buying Coke like crazy. And they found out through all the songs that they were playing, they just put that subliminal message. It was so powerful, they had to go to the government and tell the government about it. It was a great advertising thing because everybody bought Coke. But, um, but it is funny. It's like, what do you do when you walk through the stores and say, ask your parents, ask your parents, ask your parents. Uh, it's like constantly. So in our relationship with God, we want to go to heaven. We want it so bad. I mean, we get to that point, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be in darkness. I don't want the gnashing of teeth. I don't want the fire and brimstone. I don't want any of that, man. I want to go to heaven. And then you, you just go crazy. I want to be with you. I want a relationship with you. And then once we get it, we go back to doing everything that we used to do. 
We barely even open our Bible. We barely talk to God. I mean, it's like until something tragic happens. And then we're like, God, why aren't you helping me? <laughs> When's the last time we talked? <laughs> You want my help now? And fortunately, we have a God of grace and mercy. Fortunately. But man, I'll tell you, he'll let us go through it. But there's something that God wants. I know what we want. We go through the salvation store. (laughs) And we say, God, I want salvation. I want that one. I want that one. I want that. I want to be able to do this. And I I want to be able to go. But then we never, ever use it once we get it. But God, on the other hand, has given us a book of his word. Everything that he wants us to know is inside that book, and it explains our life. It's, it explains how we have a relationship with him. And if you read, you find out he really wants a relationship. He doesn't want to be a genie stuck in a bottle that whenever you're in trouble, you finally go to him. <laughs> Can I get more wishes? No, that's not how it works. Men are terrible at relationships, if you ask women. <laughs> I find out all the time. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, um, women have this um, mindset of what a relationship would be, and men have a mindset of what a relationship would be, right? And, and trust me, I mean, there's some strong debates about this, uh, especially when you read the Bible, and it says, wives, submit to your husband. You ask a man what that means? And you ask a woman what that means, it's too big. And my wife will tell you real quick, keep reading. Because right after that it says, men love your wives as Christ loves the church. (laughs) Which means Christ died for the church. He had mercy, he had grace, he had compassion. All these things that my wife looks at me and goes, you're not living up to your side of it. <laughs> and you want to talk. <laughs> I know, I haven't died for her yet. <laughs> that love and compassion and mercy stuff. Grace, oh my. <laughs> but there's more. There's more. There, the, so you think about it. You want God to give you eternal life, but while you're here, we barely talk to him. And whenever I say that, I, I, obviously I can't say this about everybody. We just, I'm generalizing just America right now, maybe even the world. But there's just very few of us that know Scripture. I am at the university getting my master's degree. And whenever I go there for that week that we spend together, um, it's eight-week classes, but one week out of the eight weeks I have to go to it. And it's amazing to me what the professors can say as they tell you what scripture says and how many people will agree with it. I will tell you, I'm not the best um, person of biblical knowledge all the time, but there, I mean, I, 90% of the time I'm sitting there going, where is that? Because that's not scripture. Or you're taking scripture and you're twisting it. And let me tell you, with the way that these universities are teaching the Bible these days, I don't even know why they call it Bible schools anymore. It's not. It's world schools. They're teaching the Bible based on how the world responds to it and how the world wants to hear it. That's not Scripture. Scripture is the way God wants us to hear it. And man, I I mean, I, I, I go through this and I'm like, man, if I didn't know Scripture enough, I would I would believe these people. What about us as Christians? What about our students that we send to these schools and they hear this mess? We need to know scripture. And we need to teach our kids scripture. Man, I look back now whenever my mom and dad used to have that little bread, fake bread tray that had all the Bible scriptures in it. And you'd read it before you went to school. You'd pick out one and read. Man, I wish we had those again. I know they still exist, but not like they used to. Used to, every Christian home had one. (laughs) It's like the bread of life, you know. You had all the scriptures in there. And you would read one and memorize it and go. Um, I didn't take advantage of it as much as now I wish I would have. We need to know scripture. If you don't know scripture, you're not really listening to God. That's communicating with God. You need to communicate with God. He wants a relationship. He does not want you to just have eternal life. That's great. 
That's obviously um, one of the major plans for him. But there's another major plan. He wants a relationship with you here on this earth. Eternity is wonderful. But it begins now. It begins here. I need to know who he is. When I get to heaven, I don't want to have to look around the crowd and say, which one's God? There's going to be other people up there. Are we going to know God because we have such a relationship with him? Uh, Tina and I, (laughs) when we first started um, um, dating, and um, it's funny that we, we didn't know anything about each other. I went... She was going to cook a meal for me, and I went over to her house, and she had all these fancy pans, pots, pans. I mean, the stuff I could never afford. I mean, it looked like she was a real chef. (laughs) And I don't care how good you are at cooking. We did not know each other well enough. And so when we finally, we went in, and it it was a perfect-looking meal. It looked like, I mean, she she came off one of those TV shows where they teach you how to cook. I mean, she was pro. And then we sat down to eat, and she brought out the plate, and it was fish. I don't even like fish. (laughs) It was the best-looking plate I've ever seen. And I'm sitting there, and obviously this is just the first um, few days of our dating, or maybe a week. we, we We don't know each other well enough, and I can't tell her I don't like it. Because it looks good. And I have to eat it. <laughs> because I can't, I, I'm not going to mess up our dating. I mean, this is just, and I'm sitting there, and it was that fish I can never say the name of. Um, yes, yeah, salmon, salmon, yeah. Well, the, sa- salmon, salmon, we're all the same. Salmon. So I remember doing that, and, and it, it was okay. I just, not a fish eater. Um, a big fish eater so she didn't know that about me she didn't learn that until days later (laughs) but you know what once we go once we started dating more we started figuring out each other more got into this relationship right we knew what each other thought we can finish each other's Thoughts and sentences a lot of the time. She can tell when I'm angry without me saying a word. She can tell when I'm going to come home and be happy by whatever, um, whatever we've talked about or whatever she saw me post on Facebook. I mean, she just knows, hey, yeah, he, he, go ahead. Alabama wins the game. She knows it's going to be a good sermon today. I mean, it's just she knows that. We... We have a relationship, but there's still something different. Once we decided to get married, and we got married, we thought we knew each other. But now you're in the same house, using the same restroom, using what's supposed to be two separate toothbrushes. I'm like, whoa, whoa, who, who, who used my toothbrush? Oh, my God, I didn't know this happens. Right? I mean, and then, and then, and then who does the laundry and how they do the laundry? Ah, yeah. And who folds the clothes? Because I know in the Bible it says that the women are to fold the clothes. I know it. I know it. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But I'm sitting. But it's funny. As your relationship, when you start dating, you know nothing about each other. But as you really get it, um, more and more hanging out together, you, why? Because you've been talking on the phone for hours when you're dating. You are talking on the phone. You are I'm going places together. Your friends barely know you. In fact, her friends, I love this sermon today. This is all about you today. Her friends called her dad and mom on these first few days that we were dating. And it's funny because it it goes hand in hand with what I just said. They were so worried because they have not been in communication with her at all. She doesn't return phone calls. Why? She's talking to me. She doesn't hang out with them. Why? She's hanging out with me. I mean, we are dating. We are starting to see each other. We're seeing each other every single day. Seriously, she drove up in a Corvette. I would not get out of the Corvette. I'm like, dude, this is awesome. Let's go to San Diego. That was my first words to her. 
let me drive. <laughs> and then I hit a pole. Anyway, we won't go into that. Um, so <laughs> it was in a parking lot. <laughs> Did not know that they extended. Anyway, um, so um, yeah, it was crazy. She loves me. Um, her friends called her dad and mom. And said, we think that something's happened to Tita because she hasn't contacted us. We've been calling her. We think that she may have met a guy that, um, and, and started building up this horror story. Like I kidnapped her or something. So, <laughs> like, like God doesn't have a sense of humor, right? Um, so, we're sitting there eating that meal that she made that I'm sitting there forcing down, right? I mean, like nothing can go wrong now because I'm eating the salmon um, thing. And... The door of her house does this. Bam! And in comes dad. Dad, out of no, no questions asked, comes right up and goes, your friends haven't heard from you. And she's like, well, I'm just having dinner with Paul. Dad, this is Paul. And I do the, what most guys would do. Put out my hand. And he just stands there. This is awkward. <laughs> he will not shake my hand. He goes, where have you been for three, four days? Well, we've been to San Diego. We've been here. We've been there. We've been going. Everybody's trying to reach you. You know what? In a relationship with God, all of a sudden, the, you, the world doesn't mean as much to you anymore. Because now, when you really love Jesus, it's not just about getting saved. It's about finding out as much as you can. Spending as much time. Because it's a relationship. And that relationship that goes together, you begin to know about Jesus. Your friends are going to start worrying about you saying, oh, you don't go down to the bar anymore. You don't go and do this anymore. You don't go do that anymore. They're going to start questioning you. They're going to come in with anger. Say, hey, what's going on? You're, you don't like us anymore. No, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm in love with Jesus. Jesus has changed my life. See, that's a relationship. And then you begin to say, I need to know more. I start reading the Bible. You say, man, the Bible is so confusing. At least that's what Satan wants you to think. Because any ex-boyfriend or girlfriend would do the same thing. I remember whenever we were dating, her ex-boyfriend would keep calling. I'm like, seriously? E ex means something. Used to be. The past. Uh, boyfriend. Present. <laughs> but he keep calling. She kept talking to him. But that was dating, right? That was dating. Same thing happened to me. We were dating, and my girlfriend would call me. Just seeing how you react to that. <laughs> no, my, my, my girlfriend would call me. We'd still talk, right? It's just like Satan getting into your relationship with God. He wants to mess it up. And you know, I know what the boyfriend's saying. I mean, I know. It's your, hey, let's just go out on one more date. Let's just go out and hang out here. Let's go. You know what? Satan does the same thing in the relationship that you have with God. Hey, come on. Just go, go back over here. Come on. Let's hang out together a little bit. Let's just, you know, let's don't end this. Maybe you can uh, see him every once in a while. See me every once in a while. Satan is there to mess up your relationship with God and if he tells you oh the Bible's so confusing this relationship's so weird it starts just digging in and then all of a sudden you're not reading the scripture because you don't think you can understand it even though the Bible says that his spirit will give you the knowledge he will give you the understanding it says anything that you ask it will be done you know what you want to know more about the Bible pray and ask because God promised that he would do that but Satan doesn't want you to know that. It's all down. It's all bad. And Satan gets in there and starts ripping you apart and saying, no, no, you can't do this. Well, once you say, okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the Bible. You know what? Is it one time a day? Is it two times a day? Is it, is it once a week? It depends on how much you're in love with Jesus. How much do you really want to know? Well, I read my Bible last month. Is that good? Is that the relationship you want? Then good for you. I want to know more about Jesus. I want to be in a relationship that whenever I call on him, I know that he answers me. He hears me. He loves me. You want to be in a relationship that you talk to each other once a month? Fine. 
Remember. When you go and you ask Jesus for miracles to take place and you don't even know a scripture that you could use that is his word. I'm not sure that praying and reading the Bible once a month is going to do it. But there's something else. When you really get married, as Tina and I got married to each other, we found out there's, there's new things in our relationship that we have to work out. Um, who controls the financings, finances? Do we need separate bank accounts? Do, um, who cleans the house? Who does the dishes? Who, who washes the laundry? Who takes care of the cars? Um, and she does all of this. This is wonderful. You're a wonderful. Oh, yeah. Sell for the car. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> then we have kids, and we find out neither one of us have to do it. <laughs> the kids. Oh, this is good. Kids are great. Oh. But then you get in this marriage relationship and you start learning, hey, you know what? Um, I don't do all the laundry. We do it together. Or we have um, things that we do um, and we start organizing and we start getting used to each other. We find out there are two separate toothbrushes. And then you know, I love servants. I love these. Um in our relationship with Jesus, we start growing in our faith. You moved in with him. You have this relationship where you're married to him. You are the bride. And he will die for you. He did die for you. But he will live for you. Because he did. He rose from the dead so that you can have life through him. This is how much that he loves you. This is how much he cares for you. But you got to find out what's your role in this. What's your place? Well, you're, you, you know that you need to communicate. You know that you need to love. You know that you need to participate. He says, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. Isn't that funny? A lot of us don't do that. We love him, but we don't keep his commandments. He says, you will, because you love me. And you know that the reason I give commandments is why? Because I died for you, and I love you. And I live for you, and I give you eternal life. So obviously, my love is so strong for you, I wouldn't tell you anything wrong. I wouldn't direct you the wrong way. So if you love me, follow my path. Go the way that I'm telling you to go, because I've already taken care of everything for you. This relationship is so strong that you need to love God so much that you're willing to live for him. And then... As you grow in this faith, you find out that the things that you pray for, God answers. And then you find out that you start wanting things from God. And he starts holding stuff back. I'm like, God, why wouldn't you do this for me? Why wouldn't you help me? See, because whenever you begin in a relationship, you begin to to grow stronger and stronger but what he wants is a relationship and he wants you to trust him and the only way that you learn to trust him is by him not giving you everything that you beg for the only way is to say hey I'm going to give you the things that you need and I'm going to supply your needs but you can't just sit there and say hey I want a Rolls Royce and I want it now and it's just going to pop up or I want a Ferrari or I want whatever else I I want a billion dollars I want to win the lotto 1.6 billion dollars back then you know that one guy won it Why wasn't that me? See, in our relationship with God, it's not about what all he can give you. It's about trusting him that everything that you have is what you need and that he is going to take you all the way through. In fact, whenever we read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is clear. Whenever he freed the um, Israelites from Egypt... He did not just provide them with everything. He gave them what they needed. He gave them the path to go on. They wanted to go this direction. And he said, no, you go this way. So they began to go. And then they complained the whole time. That was a shorter path. You made us go the long way. Now we're out in the wilderness. We're out in the desert. It's, it, there's no food around here. We need food. And then he provides food. He says, there's no water. And he provides water. You know what he says? I just want a relationship with you. I, I want you to know that I'm there for you. Anytime you need anything, I'm there. It doesn't matter what the, the land says. It doesn't mean that there's, there's trees and there's um, lots of fruit or there's a stream of water. Even when you look out and there's absolutely nothing, I want you to know that I can provide it in that. 
That's what God wants. He wants a relationship with no matter what you can see. And he says, walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. That means if you can't see it, don't worry about it. God's got it handled. I got this, says God. That's right. But then there's that thing. That thing that happens. It happens. And it happens to everybody. But we don't know it. It only happens to me. It seems like I'm in this little bubble of walls that I can't get out of. And it's like I'm just, there's this thing around me. And only bad stuff happens to me. And God doesn't see me. He'll bless you. But me. Because whenever you go through a relationship with God, it's between you and him. It's not with you and everybody else and him. It's with you and him. And whenever you're in that relationship, you say, oh, God blessed them. And God blessed them. And God did a miracle over here. But he's not doing squat for me. And, and you get angry because, oh, the blue truck out there, won't. we have a mobile stage that has to be moved, and the truck won't run. We have to live off of the income that the church provides, and then one of our tenants moves out, which means thousands of dollars has just gone out the door. My wife takes um, a, 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 going into the ministry more, so we leave that job to go into the ministry, and then the ministry is just like, no money. And then you look there and go, God, what about us? What about what we're doing? See, we look out there and we see thousands of dollars in bills coming in, and but we don't have income going out. It's like, wait, I mean, it's like the bills are coming in, but where's the income? Why is it the truck running? The one thing that we need to move that stage to go around and do our ministry. Oh, it's whining. You know what God wants? Walk by faith, not by sight. You can't see it, but I got this handled. That's what God says. You can't see it, but I got it. Don't look at what you you see is not there. I want a relationship where we're beyond deciding who's going to do the chores around the house. We're in a relationship where you're going to trust me. We've been doing this for so long, Paul. You know me. You know that I'm God. You know that I provide. You know that I've never let you down, and I never will. So let's just go through this knowing that everything is going to work out the way I planned it. And you need to trust me because we've been in this relationship for a long time. But it doesn't matter because I'm Paul Carney, and I don't have that much faith. I thought I had faith. I thought I was good on this. But no, I don't. And then you start to break down and you start to whine. And I'm saying me, but you know what happens to you too. We don't see that because we're in our little wall. This doesn't happen to anybody else. It just happens to me. But then I find out from talking to others, you're worried, why why didn't God hear my prayer? Why didn't God answer me? Why didn't God do this? Why is he letting bad things happen? Man, these questions are not just what Paul asked when he's going through it. Every single one of us seem to be asking that. When, it, when you don't see God work, it's like he's silent. It's like he, you think, oh, man, I'll just read the Bible. He's going to speak to me. And he doesn't. It's like it doesn't click. Then you wake up at night stressing and worrying. The other night I woke up just worrying about all the things that's going on. And like, well, God, where are you in this? So I read the scripture. I read, and it's like nothing. Silence. This is not fair. You are acting so much like I do with my wife. <laughs> like, I just get silent. That's why I want to talk to you about faith. When you're going to have faith in God, you're having faith not in the good times only. You're having faith during the bad times as well. But what about those emotions? What about those where I really get one-on-one with God? God, I don't understand what you're doing. You can't provide a truck that works? Really? You can't provide the income for me and my family? Seriously? 
You are God. You're the creator. You do all this, but you, me, you just kind of like, I mean, what? Now, this is the common thing that we all do, at least from my observation of not just our church, but others. What did I do that you won't bless me? What sin have I done that you are punishing me for? And then if you look back at the story of Elijah and whenever he went to the widow woman, guess what she said? Why did my son die? What sin did I do that your God is bringing up that he's going to curse me now and take my son? Right? We all do it. It comes back to, you know what? Look at it this way. I'm not saying that sin will uh, make these, but if you're, uh, but we're not talking about the sinner having a relationship. We're talking about you as a Christian, as a believer. You've given your life to Jesus. It's not about the sins that you've done. It's about moving forward in your relationship. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and he takes you step by step, and he's going to get to a point. He, he, if you want to know more about God, let me take everything away from you so you trust me and you depend on me, and then you'll see something. But if you have all this other stuff in the way, you keep looking at these other things things for your help and your resources and that's not showing me that's showing that and I want to make sure that you see me and I'm going to take everything out of your path so you see me clearly and it's one of those things but during that time you're like God what are you doing and then there's this book that you all ignore and it's in the Bible because this is part of the process of having faith called lamenting and it's okay it's okay for you to get down on your knees and go God why don't you love me why are you doing this to me see there's a few chapters in the book of lamentations and it's after Jeremiah had told the told Israel that they need to repent and come back to God, otherwise they're going to be destroyed, and they wouldn't listen. So instead of going and saying, I told you guys so, when Nebuchadnezzar came up and took them, I told you guys so, he didn't do that. He actually went to a cave in Golgotha, which is the place of the skull, where, uh, you know, the story of Jesus being crucified, right? Well, there's actually th- some caves there, and by the looks of it, there's a cave and a cave and a cave, and it looks like, like a skull. Well, this is one of the places, um, I, I won't even say the name of it, it's Jeremiah's something but anyway um it's where they say that jeremiah went in there and wrote the book of lamentations he was lamenting for what had taken place in my own life and on yours read lamentations hear how he pours out his heart to god going man everything's been taken everything's destroyed it's okay to lament it's okay to whine to God. He says this, he says, I, in Lamentations 3, I am the man who has seen affliction because of the rod of his wrath. I'm talking about God's wrath. He has driven me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely against me, he has turned his hand repeatedly all day. He has caused my flesh and my skin to waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and encompassed me with the bitterness and hardship. In dark places he has made me dwell like those who have long been dead. Jeremiah is so down. Remember, he's the one that went out and told Israel that this was going to happen. But now in this time that he is saying, God, you've done all this bad stuff. You've sent me to this place. You've, you've done this. I mean, it's like I'm dead. He's crying out to God and saying, look at what's all happened to me. Like those who have been long dead, he has walled me in so that I cannot go out. What did I talk about the wall? You feel like you are inside of this all alone. Now, I'm not sure exactly if that's exactly what, because he was actually thrown into a pit. He was actually uh, into a well. I mean, there was things that happened to him. And maybe he's talking, but whenever I read this, I'm like, dude, he's talking about that place that is just you and God, and God doesn't care. 
It's that place you get where God doesn't hear your prayer. And you just think it's all about you. And you're inside this brick wall or this, this bubble of some kind or something that just keeps you. So you can't get out of it because God obviously is not listening to you. It says, he has made, me, made my chain heavy. Even when I cry out and call for help, he shuts out my prayer. This is Jeremiah the prophet saying, whenever I call out to you, you've shut out my prayer. You're not even listening to me. Dude, when I read this, God did not keep this out of the Bible. He, he didn't want you to think, oh, whenever you're a Christian, everything's going to go wonderful. We're going to have this great communication. No, he says this is real. You are going to see it before your eyes. You are going to see things happen, and you're going to start questioning me, and you're going to start yelling at me, and you're going to think that I don't hear you. I mean, it's right here. It's the real deal. If you thought you were going to get this fake life once you became a Christian, it, there's no way. It, that's not the way God plans it. It's the real life. God loves you so much. He wants you to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. He wants you to know. He knows your feelings. He knows what you're going through. He knows you feel deserted. And he said, others have done this too, even my prophets. He's made my chain heavy. Whenever I read through that, I'm like, dude, you're not kidding. We're going to go into ministry. And my wife has no more income coming in. My income's been cut like, like two-thirds or whatever. Um, the truck doesn't run out there. Her battery's dead on her car. Um, I mean, it, it's like boom, 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 boom. Really, one more thing, God. Seriously, one more thing. Your chains are heavy. They start loading you down. He has made my paths crooked. <laughs> God, you're not even sending me the right direction. Send me like this. He has turned aside my ways and torn me to pieces. <laughs> he has bent his bow. And I'm the target. That's lamenting. God, you hate me. You were shooting your arrows at me. Whenever you lament, you're taking all of that, that feelings that you have. You are still human. You are still real. You still live a life down here in this world. And we don't truly understand God all the time, a lot of the time. And, and so whenever you're going through this process of gaining faith, guess what? You're going to lament a lot because you don't understand. That's why I'm saying if you're going to still date God, <laughs> he's going to be your one month, read the Bible, pray. You won't get this. You won't understand this process. But when you start reading and you start understanding and you start seeing and you build this relationship, you say, I'm going through what Jeremiah went through. I'm going through what David went through. I'm going through what Moses went through. I'm going through what all the people that believed in God go through as they gain their knowledge and understanding of him. Because you're turning away from the ways of the world and you're turning to God and that's a whole different lifestyle. Your bank account does not get you into heaven any sooner or later. It's your faith in God that builds your relationship and gets you to trust him. And then, I love verse 21. We're just going to skip down and then I'm going to end this. Um, 21. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. You can lament and you give it all to God and then he brings up a memory to you. Like he used to bring up to the Israelites to say, remember Egypt when I freed you, <laughs> when you were enslaved? Remember the water when I split the water and you walked across on dry land? Remember whenever you didn't have food and I just sent it down every day from heaven? Remember when you didn't have water and Moses went out there and tapped on a rock and water comes out? See, we have, after we just frustration just flows out to God and then he just calms us and gives us this and I think in verse 21 this is where Jeremiah was like 
God just said, all right, let's check this out. Check this out. And God just does this, and he just brings you to this place. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in him. All of a sudden, you see Jeremiah come into life. He was dead. He was done. He's like, God, where are you? And then God just speaks to him and starts giving him that hope, which is what he does for each and every one of us. He just gives it and says, look, this is where your hope comes from. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. The yoke in his, no, it is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and be silent since he has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is hope. Let him give his cheek to the smiter. Let him be filled with a reproach for the Lord will not reject forever. For he causes grief. Then he will have compassion. According to his abundant loving kindness. You're going to go through it. I'm going through it. I've been through it a few times. I should know the system. But you know what? We can't act like as Christians we're just going to go through life and everything's going to be right there. You know what? We have to know that we need to know who God is. We need to have a relationship that we know we can trust him as we go through something. See, he wants more than you just saying, you're, you got saved. I got saved. Great. What are you doing with it? I live a life where I trust in God every day and every morning is new. He does new things every day. And he's going to bless you. But he says, it's better for you just to wait on the Lord. Because then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. Read Lamentations. I know it's, it's a hard one to read sometimes because it's so sad. <laughs> but it has so much hope in it. Especially when you're going through stuff that you just say, it's out of my hands. It's out of my control. I don't know, I don't know what God's doing. Why me? <laughs> it's not about you. You're not in this alone. God's in it with you. But this process is through even the greatest believers. All of us have went through this stage of this relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're going to grow in your faith, stand up boldly and go through it. Lament, lament. But then remember, let God speak to you and give you hope like he did with Jeremiah. 